Today on The Guest List, we're talking to Rupi Kaur. We just kind of wanted to know if you can explain your journey and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, um, I, I started performing, it was like by fluke actually, uh, in high school. I was in like a really bad place. I saw a, I went to like this local community event that these um, local activists had put on. And there were all these young Punjabi Sikh people on stage talking about the genocide that we'd gone through back in India. And I was really, really inspired. And I was like, I want to go to more events like this. So I found a smaller one that was happening like a month after that event. And um, I don't know, I decided to write this poem. I didn't even, I, I wouldn't even call it a poem because at the time I didn't really know that what I was doing was spoken word. I thought that I was like storytelling. That's what I called it. I was just making things up as I went. The poem that I wrote was horrible, um, but at the time probably thought it was amazing and uh, went and I performed it. And it was like the first time that I felt so heard and so seen. There was only like 20, 25 people in that room, but it to have them just listen was very life-changing. And after the event, everybody was like at least a decade older than me too. And so I'm like surrounded by these folks. And you know, when you're like 16, 17 and people are a decade older than you, it just is more dramatic than now, right? And so they were so kind and so sweet. And they were like, you need to come back. We need, we need your voice. Like all these sweet things they didn't even need to say. But um, so I became a community organizer with, this group of young activists and what we would do is put on local events. Um, and what we were really talking about was, were the issues community in Malton and Brampton, um, female feticide, uh, is a big issue in our community in Canada and also back home, um, farmer suicide, big issue back home. Um, and we did talk about a lot of things happening there because we, us being immigrants was a result cause of the issues back home. And our parents were reeling from a genocide that they saw happening in the eighties and throughout the nineties. And so seeing our parents go through that, I think that those were always regular dinner table conversations. So suddenly Brampton had this, group of youth that were so charged to talk and be political. Um, so that's really where my poetry journey came from. And though that's what I was talking about. And then it somehow got into within that, I got into writing more about my experiences as a woman, um, because as lovely as my community is, and I would lay down my life for them. We have a very big problem as this, many communities do with just you know, the patriarchy within the community and giving women the space to feel and be empowered. And so I started writing about that. And honestly, I never intended for any of this to happen, but it did. Um, even when I went to university, I was like, oh, I'll be a lawyer. Or I'll do this or I'll do that. Um, and then I self-published thinking that, you know, a couple of my friends would buy my book. And then I like even bought all my LSAT prep books. I was like ready to go. But it's still to my mind, even after that first book was published, I didn't consider myself an author because I thought like that was so out of the realm of what real life could possibly be. Um, and I was so focused on taking care of my family. Like my dad is a mom never worked. Um because the childcare was is so inaccessible. And so she stayed at home to raise us. And I think I actually have a line about this in one of my new poems that I'm performing. Um, even as somebody who was young, my dad worked so much and for a long period, for a decade, he was extremely, extremely sick. And so seeing that, I always had this fear of like, what am I going to do if he passes away, I have to hold this family together. So that like weight of, I have to take care of like six people has always been on my head. Nobody said that, but it's like, I take it upon myself as like the oldest of four kids. Um, and so I think 
because of that, I would have never, ever considered, um, going like really going into poetry and being an author, but because it just sort of like happened, I think I feel very lucky for that. Um, but it was probably after my second or third book, I was like, okay, I think I can call myself an author now. Still feels weird though. Wow. Well, that was amazing. Wow. What a journey. Um, you kind of already kind of dipped into it, but, um, a lot of what you write is also experiences of like, as you mentioned, those around you, your parents and what they went through. Um, but how do you apply these situations and all these experiences and to your writing and make them applicable and relatable to like me as a reader? Um, I don't know, but what I try to do, I think why I love writing so much is I'm a better communicator through my writing than I am a verbal communicator. I always find it easier to have like, I wish I could just have hard conversations through email. Like, let me just write a one page PDF about how I'm feeling and send it to you. Um, I find that there's like so many emotions we feel it's like hard to put into words. And like, for example, in Homebody there, which is my most recent book, the first chapter about mental health, it took me years to get to a place where I could even write about and define what depression feels like. And it's like for me, because I went through years of not knowing how to put it into words. And so putting it into words is like a very empowering thing. And I think it takes time because these feelings and these experiences are so big and sometimes feel so beyond us, but, you know, chipping away at it. I, I love like just taking this giant feeling and putting it into a few words. And I think that that's what makes it relatable because people always tell me they're like oh my god like I read this poem and it was like how do you know about my life and it's like I don't but I sat with this and thought about it in relation to my life for so long and I think that's probably why people relate right wow <laughs> um so your books have recently been banned in Texas um how do you keep that from bringing you down well, there's been um, attempt, an attempt in many areas in Texas and actually different states to ban milk and honey. Um, I feel it doesn't get me down. It gets me enraged. <laughs> like, it just makes me angry. And it makes me angry because, like, the real victims are the young readers, you know? The young readers who can't afford to go to a bookstore or, you know, have their parents support them in buying a book like Milk and Honey. Um, the pe young people who find comfort or like valuable information in these books, like they're the real victims. And like Milk and Honey is just one of many hundreds of books, actually, that are people, the lawmakers are attempting to ban. And there's already been hundreds of books banned about racism about women's rights like if you some if you like mention abortion like i have my friend john irving in one of his books he talks about it's like fictional it, there's like a scene about abortion and that book is banned and i think that's just like it's so ridiculous and with milk and honey i'm just like this is a book about a young woman's experience with sexual assault and like overcoming that which is not inappropriate whatever that word even means it, like at all it just blows my mind i feel like the parents who are you know working and rallying to ban this book and many like it perhaps haven't even like read the full book i don't understand it but i feel really lucky i feel like the superheroes and all of this are the librarians i've been getting emails from teachers and librarians for years just like fighting for it and get keeping it on bookshelves well if you think about it a lot of the books that are banned like you said i mean they're about really heavy topics but they're i mean revolutionary they're world changing yeah I mean, you can consider yourself amongst the greats with them like your work is that great that they're kind of like too scared to have those conversations Thank and you. So it's crazy. Um, it's so, crazy. <laughs> um, you're going on world tour. Um, how do you find that your content translates across to people um, 
you know, around the world and in different countries, regardless of culture. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't worry about it so much when I'm like going to like the UK, Canada or the States. Um, But different cities respond to different things. Like different cities are there. Some are more hyped than others. Um, Detroit was so intense. I love a I love a loud crowd. I want them to interrupt me. I tell them to interrupt me. I tell them like, if you want to say something, well, you better shout it out and let me hear it, you know? Um, and they were just, and Detroit was so, so funny. They were just so into it in Chicago too. Last night, um, there was a young woman. She's actually, tw- she's my age. She's 29. And she was just the whole time, it felt like she was, it was just her and I in the room. Um, Cause she was just like responding very loudly to every single thing I was saying. And she was so funny that I had to bring her up on stage. Um, but I, I think I, I am thinking now about like, how is it going to translate in countries where English is not their first language? Like when I go to Italy or when I go to Spain, um, I don't know. But I've been to these places before and what I've realized is it's never as hard as I think it is because at the end of the day, I'm just talking about human emotions and experiences and those are universal regardless of race or or class. Okay. Um, As an artist, a poet, what do you hope that people walk away with when they hear you read your poetry or when like I read your poetry, like what is your hope and intention? I think the best thing about, like I want people to come and see me perform, especially now after the pandemic is it's like, I think I live for that feeling of being connected and growing up, I used to feel deeply, deeply connected at all times with my friends because I was spending so much time with them and we were constantly doing things and making things. And I definitely lost that over the years. And as adults, I think we lose that because we start to prioritize our careers and work things that necessarily don't feel that our souls aren't connected to. And then we're not prioritizing the things that actually give us joy. So when people come to the show, I get that feeling. And I know that they do too, because for that 90 minutes, we are so connected and we're laughing and we're there. And it's like, that's the feeling I've been missing for the past two and a half years. Um, So how does your identity as a Punjabi Canadian translate into your work? Um, It's me being Punjabi sick. So it's so interesting because like, I identify as Punjabi Sikh, like Sikh being my faith and Punjab being like the ethnic sort of group of where where we come from. Um, And it's like a, it is all of my work. It's like, that's the ones I'm writing through and I will never ever do anything else because that's the only lens that I know. And I think that even being Canadian, I'm able to proudly say Punjabi Sikh because like where I grew up in Canada, Honestly, race and culture and diversity was always celebrated in those areas because I think there's just, Toronto is a very special place with so many immigrants from over a hundred countries. And so um, we were always empowered to feel connected to where we came from. And like Canada felt like a place that we could do that. And of course it's problematic. And of course there's like extremely racist parts everywhere, but um, I grew up around such diversity and it was celebrated so much in school. So um, I'm really thankful for that. Cause I've never felt ashamed of celebrating my identity. That's amazing. Um, so you're clearly a, a huge champion for women and advocate for our rights. Um, how might your poetry be contributing to the involvement of women's rights today? Um, what do you mean? Like, so, I mean, a lot of your work, it celebrates women. It tells mm. stories about, you know, our struggles, our stories. Yeah. How might you think that, I mean, your poetry and um, everything that you're speaking in it 
contributes and um, yeah. kind of affects today's society and, I mean, helps us in our everyday struggles to kind of move forward with gaining equality. Yeah, I, I feel really lucky to be one of like many voices um, sort of contributing my thoughts and my ideas. But I see what's so cool is like when I published Milk and Honey, some of the topics that I was writing about were so taboo. And it's so amazing to see that. I mean, that was eight years ago. Um, and in eight years, all those topics that were taboo and like people were like, oh my God, you're writing about this. Nobody's writing about this. Those aren't taboo anymore. Those are just conversations we're having on a regular basis, um, hopefully. And um, there's been this incredible movement for women, anybody who identifies as a woman in general. Um, but then, I mean, with this abortion ban, I think it's like really, first of all, it's like hard to wrap my head around, but it's like pulled me back to feeling like I'm 20 again and it's like this weird thing where I'm starting to feel well I feel enraged and um and I'm like finding myself even on tour like picking up my pencil and picking up my pen to write about that because it's like okay they're coming <laughs> like they're trying to start a war with our bodies and so I feel very very I feel like we're ready, not ready for, we shouldn't even have to be doing this, but it's like, no, you don't fuck with us. Like we've done this. We've uh, been oppressed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And I'm done with it. That so <laughs> yeah, I'm done. I'm tired. We're tired. Let's go. <laughs> wow. No, that's amazing. Um, okay. So I, I personally wanted to know because I come from a very like conservative family, uh, strict upbringing, a religious background. My dad is very strict and just like never showed emotions. And I know that you can relate to that. Um, I just kind of, I'm curious, like where did this boldness that you have and the confidence that you have with your writing stem from? If you came from such like, cause I, I, I know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Our dad sound very similar, but I think it's because of that. I'm like, so like, nah, I'm not listening to nobody. Um, I'm, yeah, my dad was really, really, really strict and extremely paranoid considering his experiences back home. And like, I wasn't even allowed to go to a movie theater. My mom like secretly drove me to one in 10th grade for like a, a 12 o'clock afternoon movie. Like it was like the biggest deal. Um, and he obviously doesn't even know about it till this day. Like, cause his idea of a movie theater is like, what would happen back home is like, people are just selling drugs right there and women are being sexually assaulted, which fine back home that happened, but he still has these ideas. He's just like, well, you know what? I trust you, but I don't trust the world. So you can't leave the house like that sort of vibe. Um, but I think it's, that I had to like as the oldest like crawl my way through that I like get so annoyed at my younger siblings because I'm like you have no idea you have no clue what I did for us and um I think that spirit definitely is in my writing but I will say I never thought that it was going to go anywhere and so obviously they never ever knew that I was writing or performing um it was all secret and I actually used to have nightmares in college where I was like what if one of my crazy ex-boyfriends prints out these poems because I was sharing on them online and just like sends them to my parents I'm gonna get in so much trouble it used to keep me up at night um but I told my parents when so I self-published the book. I got a copy in the mail and then I like gave it to my dad during breakfast. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Awesome. So we're kind of unfortunately wrapping up here. I wish I could listen to you all day. I would <laughs> ask you This questions. is like the best group ever. Uh, I would literally ask you questions all day. I really do. <sighs> Anyways. Thank love you. you. You're all so sweet. Love you guys. <laughs>